Ecuador heads for early presidential elections this year after Guillermo Lasso dissolved the legislature late last month. What is the mood on the ground in Ecuador? The Australian government is planning to pass legislation to block the construction of a new Russian embassy in Canberra, citing security concerns. Is there more to this than diplomatic muscle flexing? And what has led to sectarian tensions in India's state of Uttarakhand? Welcome to Daily Debrief. I'm your host Shriya and these are the stories for the day. After an extraordinary series of events last month involving dissolution of Ecuador's legislature by its incumbent president Guillermo Lasso, eight presidential candidates have entered the race for the early elections scheduled to be held in August. The winning candidate will hold the position till end of 2025 for the remaining period of what would have been Lasso's term as president. On May 17, Ecuadorian President Guillermo Lasso decreed the dissolution of the country's parliament using a never-before-tested constitutional clause known as cross-death, plunging the country into an unprecedented political crisis. Martin from People's Dispatch joins us now for more. Welcome to the show, Martin. Thanks for joining us today. So, first off, who are these presidential candidates? There are eight of them. Can you take us through uh, each of them or give us a general overview of what it looks like right now? Yes, thank you for having me. It's uh, It's been a, a very unusual time in Ecuador. It's an unusual election in the middle of the term. We have eight candidates. It went from supposedly uh, should have been 16 candidates. It went to eight. And uh, there, uh, the, the, the candidates are basically going to run for a term of a year and a half until the, the, the end of what should have been uh, Lasso's term. The eight candidates are uh, very different for, from very different parties and uh, the spectrum of the polis, politics in Ecuador. Uh, the, the first one is Javier Herbas, who is a center-right wing person, uh, a liberal, basically. Uh, he ran for presidency in 2021, and uh, he got a, a pretty good amount of numbers of, of votes, but uh, he had just said that he wouldn't run, and on the next day, uh, he presented his candidacy. Then we have Jaco Perez, who is an indigenous person, but uh, linked to the right wing NGOs and uh, USAID, for example, it's a, uh, they have very uh, tight ties between uh, him and these organizations that usually come to Latin America for some sort of destabilization. He also has uh, the support of some part of the indigenous movement in Ecuador, which is also a very broad movement that goes from very left-wing uh, people like uh, Leonidas Sisa to very right-wing people as other uh, indigenous leaders in the country. Then uh, we also have Jan Topic, who is, uh, from my point of view, one of the most uh, dangerous candidates. He has... Uh, a very high possibility of winning and he would be some sort of Bolsonaro or Bukele uh, in Ecuador. Uh, he's a mercenary. This is not a way of saying thing. He's literally a mercenary. He fought in several wars. He's uh, pro-guns, pro-repression, a very right-wing person and uh, with ties to, to this kind of, of, of movements that are uh, very repressive, very, uh, I would even say, Trump-like uh, candidacy, which is uh, very uh, worrisome. Then we have uh, Luisa Gonzalez, uh, who is the candidate for the Citizens' Revolution. Uh, she will go with Andres Arauz for vice president. Uh, Andres Arauz was the one who went for the presidency in uh, 2021, the first election that the Citizens' Revolution lost, I have to say. Uh, they are pretty good candidates. There is a lot of uh, sound around them too because Luisa Gonzalez, people didn't think she would go uh, for the candidacy. We thought that Andres Arauz would be the candidate, uh, but it is the Citizens' Revolution, uh, the process that lasted 10 years in Ecuador and modernized the country and had a very progressive agenda. Um, and I, I got to say, it's 
this is the candidacy that I think the other seven candidacies are going to try to beat. It's going to be that. I think they're hoping to go to a second round of uh, in the elections, and uh, then they will all unite against this candidacy. Uh, then we have Otto Sonnenhausner. That's a very rough <laughs> last name to say. Uh, he, he was the vice president uh, to Lenin Moreno after they took out Jorge Glass, who, and uh, he's a right-wing person, uh, businessman, and uh, hoping to keep implementing the, 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 the right-wing neoliberal policies that have been going in Ecuador for the last six years. I think also he has a pretty good chance to be the one that would go to the second round. And then we have Fernando Villavicencio. He is indescribable. <laughs> He's a right-wing person uh, uh, that has been attacking the since the revolution, very close to the U.S. embassy and to U.S. aid, and uh, a very typical person of, of that sort, I would say. And then we have Bolivar Armijos, who is also a candidate. He says he's from the Citizens' Revolution, but it is not. And I think it's one of the candidates that will try to take votes from the the the, the Luisa and Andres uh, candidacy. And then we have Daniel Novoa, who is the the son of uh, of Novoa, who is the biggest and richest person in Ecuador. His father went for the presidency uh, several times and lost all of them. And now uh, he will go and it's a pretty right-wing businessman person. Right, uh, Martin, thanks for that. But another question would be, um, I mean, we, what makes these elections significant? We know there's been a political crisis triggered by the dissolution of the parliament. But uh, before that, uh, Lasso is not a very uh, preferred candidate because of all the corruption scandals and because of the embezzlement of funds. Uh, gen in general, what is the sign? Why are these elections significant? So, yes, uh, Lasso is leaving the presidency at the middle of his term. Now, this, these elections will pick both an assembly, a, a legislative power and the executive power for the rest of the term. And we will have once again elections in 2025, if I'm correct. Uh, these elections are uh, very unusual in a sense. Ecuador, before the citizen revolution, we had 10 uh, presidents in eight years before the citizen revolution. Then we had the term of, the, of, of Rafael Correa, two terms, two and a half terms. Uh, that were a very stable moment in the history of Ecuador. And now, once again, we have this turmoil. Uh, the term uh, Muerte Cruzada or Cross Dead, which is what uh, Lasso applied, it wasn't just the dissolution of the parliament. It was, yes, but it was anticipated elections. That's the, the legal term of it is anticipated elections. So Lasso uh, left his position or renounced to his position and uh, dissolve the, the parliament, the, the the assembly, the national assembly. So this makes it's a it's a constitutional uh, uh, mechanism put into into the Monte Cristi constitution that is a very uh, advanced constitution in Latin America, a very good one. Uh, and this term was uh, used and put so we don't have this inconstitutional uh, stops of uh, presidential terms. So uh, it's the first time it's been used and it's uh, kind of useful because it comes at a moment where the Lasso government has a very low credibility, a very low support. Uh, the, the, the party of Lasso, Creo, will not go to the elections. He will not run him or anybody from his party, neither for the presidency nor for the, uh, for the assembly. So uh, it's it comes in a moment where Ecuador is in a multifaceted or very crisis, very much of a crisis. We have an economic crisis. Prices are going up uh, very highly, very rapidly, even though we have the U.S. dollar as national money, a national currency. So we shouldn't have uh, this amount of, of um, 
high prices, hikes. Uh, the country has a violence crisis all over the country, especially in the in the provinces of Esmeraldas and Guayas. Uh, for example, the the prison uh, crisis where there have been massacres in the prisons, uh, loads of them in the past years, and so on. So it comes in a moment where Lasso uh, has this crisis implemented mainly because of the neoliberal policies implemented by Lenin Moreno and Guillermo Lasso. And uh, the country is in a total crisis. The National Assembly was making a political trial for the impeachment of Lasso, and then he uses the, the Muerte Cruzada, the cross death uh, uh, power that he had. And so now we have, uh, from the moment he signed that decree, we had six, mo six months to have a new uh, a new president and a new National Assembly. So this is why it's a very um, uh, unusual election that will last, the term of, of the president and the new National Assembly will last only a year and a half, basically, until we have the, the next uh, presidential and National Assembly elections that was uh, programmed for 2025, if I'm correct. All right. Thank you so much for joining us today for that important update, Martin. Thank you for joining us. Thank you very much. The Australian government has fast-tracked legislation to block the construction of a new Russian embassy in the national capital, Canberra. The move, which reportedly comes after security concerns, will, ca uh, will cancel Russia's lease for the new embassy site, which is set to be located near Australia's Parliament House. The decision, which Prime Minister Anthony Albanese has said was based on national security interests, comes in the backdrop, uh, ba backdrop of the war in Ukraine and to talk more about this we are now joined by Anish. Hi Anish, thank you for joining us. So uh, what has happened is this blocking of the construction of the new Russian embassy uh, like you know but uh, how do we decode something like this because national security and national interests have been called in to question in fast tracking this legislation to so how do we understand this first of all? Yeah so let's begin with the fact that the uh, the so-called uh, legislation or the, uh, the, uh, uh, the attempt to block has not yet happened. So they are planning a legislation. Now, uh, what shape it will take is going to be uh, very interesting to see because I don't know how they're going to, uh, like the kind of language that they're going to use, whether they do not want any embassies near the Parliament House. The whole thing was that this new embassy site is very close to the Parliament House. So the, if they do not want any embassies whatsoever near the Parliament House, or are they just going to create a specific legislation just to block the Russians uh, is something that we need to uh, wait and see. Uh, on the other hand, uh, we need to remember that uh, like there was a litigation that was happening and the Russian ambassador or the Russian embassy actually uh, won the case uh, over the lease uh, last month where uh, the fed a federal court actually decided that there was nothing wrong in leasing there was nothing illegal in leasing uh, this land and there was uh, and the russians had every right to do what they deemed there uh, including uh, you know constructing a new embassy so this land was actually given out in 2008 2009 and there has been like plans for creating a new embassy since 2011. But the fa fact that it was low paced was one of the reasons that they used earlier to block the to get the lease cancelled to block a new embassy site. Uh, but now they're using national security just like barely a month after this whole thing came up very new, very recently. And like national security concerns were not uh, a part of uh, the decision when it when they actually leased out the land or even when they tried to cancel the lease. So this is, this whole thing shows that this was an entirely ad hoc, very political reaction uh, from the Australian government. And we, it is very difficult to understand why, like the immediate, what was the immediate trigger for this, but definitely the fact that like legally they can't do anything. So they have to create a new law just to block this one, shows that this is a very reactive uh, effort by the Australian government. Right, Anisha, and the backdrop with, with, within which all of this is happening is uh, very obvious to all the audience, uh, the war in Ukraine. Can you tell us something also about Australia's efforts to pump in more military aid in Ukraine? Yeah, so uh, it is uh, something that we need to always remember how like Australia 
keeps falling within the ambit of uh, US foreign policy. It's pretty much the Australian foreign policy more or less has always been an extension to US foreign policy uh, in the region, in the Asia Pacific region, even at the cost of its own national interest many a time. Like we saw that recently with uh, their whole trade sanctions that they uh, tried to do with China and they actually suffered uh, in terms of trade and economy because China was their biggest trading partner and there was no uh, export market that they could actually find that could replace China at that moment, uh, even today. So uh, they're doing something very similar to Russia. At this point, we have seen the Australian government, along with a couple of other uh, pro-US governments in the region, like Japan and South Korea, sanction hundreds. I think in, in the case of Australia, there has been more than a thousand individuals and entities uh, in Russia that were sanctioned by uh, the Australian government over uh, this whole war in Ukraine. So Australia has very uh, taken a very partisan side at this moment. And it, ha it is actually pumping in a lot of uh, aid and even uh, equipment and, uh, you know, arms even to uh, the Ukrainian side in this entire uh, war that we have seen that has unfolded in Ukraine. So even recently, we are seeing that the Ukrainians are actually looking for, uh, you know, significant uh, donations uh, from uh, in terms of fighter jets uh, by the Australian state and it shows that the Australian state is quite uh, cozy with the government there. So definitely this is part of an extended war, like a diplomatic sort of war that uh, Russia is, uh, you know, embattled with because of its war in Ukraine uh, and uh, especially with this pro-Western governments. And we have to remember that this, uh, they tend to show themselves as uh, the international community very often, but uh, we must remember that it's just a just one block of certain governments who are actually taking the interest here and doing and going overboard in this case. Uh, even in the case of building an embassy, it's just going overboard uh, to try to block one uh, country's embassy over you know your supposed state uh, stated uh, position in a war that is happening thousands of miles away from you. So definitely, uh, we need to remember all of this uh, when we talk about this uh, in, uh, entire incident right now. Obviously, this case was uh, long-standing. That was always the argument that is being made. But this whole thing about the security concern and also the statement, like a very implicit statement made by Albanese himself, where he said that Russia does not get to uh, talk about uh, international laws and customs uh, since it does not, uh, since it apparently did not follow it uh, during its uh, during the war uh, that is happening right now, so this whole thing definitely shows like that one very s simple line that he made very clearly shows why this whole thing is happening right now, and that there is an extended war of diplomatic uh, cold war that is happening uh, between Russia and pro-Western governments all around the world. It's not just Australia, but like it is happening all around the world at this point. Thank you once again for joining us today, Anish. Sectarian tensions erupted in India's state of Uttarakhand in the district of Purola on 29th May. A major rally was taken out by right-wing bodies demanding that Muslims leave the town. In videos of the rally that subsequently went viral, mo mobs can be seen attacking Muslim-owned shops despite police presence. Subsequently, posters were noticed on all Muslim-run shops in the area threatening them with dire consequences. The harassment of Muslims hasn't, limit hasn't been limited to Purola. In nearby nearby town of Barkot, shutters of shops owned by Muslims were marked with a black cross. We turn to Pragya now for the latest developments. Hi Pragya, thanks for joining us. Uh, first off, can you take us through the series of incidents uh, that has taken place recently and towards the end of May and what has led to the situation at present? Yes, Shreya. So basically on 26th of May in a hilly uh, part of uh, India in the small state of uh, Uttarakhand, there was one young girl and two boys who were on their way somewhere and they were waylaid by some people. And the allegation was that this was a case of what the, uh, you know, the Hindu right in India refers to as love jihad meaning that since one of the two males with this young girl was a Muslim, uh, they 
and one of them was a Hindu, one of them was a Muslim. They alleged that this was a case of kidnapping. They were taking the girl away without her, uh, you know, without her consent. And that the, uh, not only that, they also alleged that the ultimate purpose of taking her away was to, uh, you know, uh, either marry her or in some way to make her into, uh, change her religion from Hindu to Muslim. Now, none of these things are based on fact. These are just allegations and claims. And it has actually created a horrible situation in the town of Puroda and in the state of Uttarakhand, which is ruled by the party which is ruling at the center, the federal level in India, which is the Bharti Janta Party. And the latest update right now is that the Hindu organizations decided that they would hold a grand meeting, a large meeting today, uh, which some civil rights activists tried to prevent it from happening by approaching the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court said that they should go to the, the court in the state of Uttarakhand, which finally said that, well, the state government is responsible for upholding law and order, meaning nothing untoward should be allowed to happen. And finally, the government issued some prohibitory orders and said that, well, you cannot have this grand assembly, this grand meeting of uh, Hindu religious uh, people of the Hindu religion uh, in this uh, in this town. And they uh, seem to have effectively effectively prevented it from happening. The reason for the concern about law and order, which the High Court has expressed, is is that you know ever since the girl and those two young men with her were stopped from being together and the allegations were made against them all almost all the muslim residents of purola who have been there reportedly living there for the last five decades almost all of them have left the town now these are small populations of muslims who live in the uh, hilly parts of this state, which is often very remote parts and inaccessible parts. And th they are really like, they are really people who, uh, the interesting fact that has come out is also that many of these Muslims were supporters and members of the ruling party. The ruling party has been saying that they are trying to woo Muslims, uh, Muslims of a uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, a background which is not privileged, underprivileged Muslims, they say that they're going to help them and they're going to assist them. They're going to help them in their progress. They're going to help them access government schemes and they're going to be invited to vote for the ruling party as well. Now, some of the Muslims in this town were actually supporters, voters and even held minor offices for this ruling party but all of them have had to leave they have been talking to the media news click uh, where i work has also been reporting on this issue that they are extremely disappointed and shocked and you know essentially you are rendering people homeless and the question arises you have had skirmishes you've shut down their shops uh, according to a report filed in news click there were 45 shops owned in parola by muslims 42 of the shop owners and all of the muslim shop boys who worked in those shops have left so then what is the purpose of the hindus getting together if anything it is for the state government uh, and you know the central government since it's the same party to get together and try and find a way to get the communities together right Right. And uh, on that note, uh, Pragya, I mean, it may be too early to say something, but where do you think uh, this is headed, uh, given how Uttarakhand's politics is? You mentioned it's also ruled by the Bharatiya Janata Party, which is also at the center. So what do you think about that? Yeah, Shri, it's hard to really predict, but obviously there is a very big election coming in India next year. And for the Bharatiya Janata Party, the ruling party, the primary platform on which they have been asking for votes regularly in election after election whether they win or lose is the hindu plank you know the hindutva plank what 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 can be translated as hinduness and uh, you know creating this fear of losing your hindu identity among the people who constitute more than 80 percent of the population creating that fear vis-a-vis -vis the Muslims who are, according to the last census, about 15 to 16% of the population. That has been their main agenda. The problem is not just the fact that they are 
basing their politics on what is untrue, but that it's actually affecting people's lives. Uttarakhand is a tourist dependent state. The local people who live there had been living peacefully. Now this love jihad uh, agenda, uh, which is, you know, totally a trumped up agenda has been used to divide people who live together for for decades. So, right. the, I mean, you ask me, where can it go? Uh, it, you know, it, it it's up to people actually to turn around and say that they don't agree. And unfortunately, in Purola, we're finding that the Muslims who have left, naturally, they're very upset, they're very angry. And they have been saying that they are upset because the their Hindu neighbors never asked them to, uh, you know, stay back. And that is where I think the government needs to intervene. That's where people also need to put pressures uh, to ensure that communities aren't divided for politics because what is happening in Uttarakhand could very well become the BJP's model for the entire nation tomorrow, uh, you know, in a few months when the election campaign heats up. And uh, like I said, they do it whether they win or lose. So, uh, you know, it's not about what happens to the electoral fortunes of one party or the other, but that the economic losses, the social losses, the, that entire fabric should not be torn apart. Thanks for that important update, Pragya. Thanks for joining us. Thanks, Ria. And that's all we have for today. For more such stories, keep watching people's dispatch.org. You can also follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram.